here we are with chapter 15 of the girl code by florence webb maxwell happy birthday desma mama came from behind me and before i could turn around she rubbed some butter on my nose so that when i felt the soft creamy blob i jumped up from my desk and fell backwards into papa's arms got you by surprise at last he said with a laugh as he grabbed me and then handed me a warm washcloth this is the first birthday in a long time I've greased your nose. Papa was right. My eighth birthday was the last time my parents were able to catch me by surprise with that old Bermuda custom. Even at school, one had to watch out for Hugh and Dedrick, who took a delight in greasing a person's entire face instead of just the nose. Thank goodness today was Saturday. Then I remembered that they were the only ones from the class who signed up for the frolic party. I wish I knew who started this nose greasing business and what it's supposed to prove, I said, trying to look annoyed but not succeeding for both my parents were smiling as if their faces were about to crack. The custom has been around Bermuda ever since I could remember and the birthday person just has to be on the alert. Maybe getting my kidding caught today is a bad omen, I thought. All the bad luck that had already fallen around the 16th birthday. Mama's smile vanished and she grabbed my shoulders. None of that nonsense. Just remember, in all things, be thankful. Now just get ready and go down and get that mobilette license. When you come back, we want you to relax so that your guests will see a cheerful birthday girl this afternoon. Mama was adamant about my not helping with any of the preparation. After I returned from getting the license, Papa took the mobilette over to the garage to put it on display. It was a beauty, all right, and I was thankful that nothing was able to spoil that birthday gift. Everyone was going out of their way to make my birthday a happy one. Benny had designed a placard of my equation in his finest calligraphy, and it was on my desk with a note from Eileen. Hope you like it. Benny and I brought it over when you went to get your license. Got to hurry home to get ready for the party. Can't wait to see what you're wearing. I took another look at the equation that Benny had printed on the placard. The letters were in red calligraphy, outlined in black. I visualized myself at the boycott, holding it high so everyone could read. If A is girl caught standing up for justice, then A plus X, A equals X plus Y plus Z. X is knowledge, Y is integrity, and Z is action. I tried not to dwell on the list with the ticks from the two clowns. Yesterday, when I told my parents they did not need to prepare so much food because many of my classmates were not coming, Papa spread the invitation to the church folks, hoping to swell my guest list. Later, I overheard him tell Mama that many from the congregation were not interested because they said if anything happened at the boycott, they did not want to be on the wrong side of the law. Good old Reverend Matters and his wife and the young preacher Timothy decided to come anyway because they were against segregation and were also supportive of my block party. I flopped down on the bed and turned my attention to the party outfit that Mama had placed over my, bed, over my bedspread. Looking at the pale green dress with its scoop neck and wide circular skirt, it now seemed inappropriate for a block party and boycott afterwards. Mama had even purchased a cinch belt to match because I had decided against the fashionable gathered waistline. If I did not turn up at the party wearing the dress, I would seem ungrateful, especially since she had gone to the trouble to get Mrs. Jones, an expensive dressmaker, to copy it from a pattern I had admired in the Sears and Roebuck catalog. Although I knew that I should be getting ready for the party and that I had to be at Papa's garage to greet the few guests who were coming, I sat on the edge of the bed and buried my face in my hands. Thoughts of my original party plans rushed through my mind. The sleepover, going to see Hugh Brenner and the Buccaneer, and cutting my special birthday cake while everyone sang happy birthday. I was even going to show off my new blue mobilette, painted by Papa to look like the latest model that was going on the market later this year. But in less than a week, all of my plans had changed. I was so busy feeling sorry for myself that I did not hear anyone enter my bedroom until an arm went around my shoulders. I knocked three times, said a vaguely familiar voice. I expected to find you ready for your party. I swung around and let out an ear-splitting high C octave scream. Aunt Desma, are you for real? My aunt, wearing an elegant pink linen suit, eased down beside me, her arms still around me. I hope I'm for real, she said with that low rumbling laugh I remembered hearing before she left Bermuda for Canada eight years ago. 
She pulled me closer, so close that I felt as if my body had melted into hers and a peaceful calm flowed through my veins, reassuring me that giving thanks was in order. Aunt Desma took both of my hands and held them for a while, neither of us saying anything as we stared at each other. She was the first one to dissolve the silence. You have grown into a beautiful young lady, Desma, and I feel so proud of you. A block party and going to the boycott afterwards? I could never come up with an idea like that at 16. I would have been too busy getting mad over my spoiled plans. When did you come, Aunt Desma? was all I could say. I dared not trust myself to tell her how I had felt about my spoiled plans. Yesterday. Her warm hands rubbed the back of my neck. Your papa picked me up from the airport, but I stayed with a friend overnight. My school closed for the summer vacation last month, so I was able to get everything organized to come here in time to surprise you on your birthday. Aunt Desma was the headmistress of a private high school in Ottawa, and I remembered when I turned 10, she wanted me to come to live with her because she believed I would get more opportunities in a bigger city. I should have stayed in Bermuda to fight, she said. Her voice quivered and I felt her hand tremble as she rubbed my back. I had to get out, Desma, I had to get out. I looked up, her eyes were watery. She blinked, stood up and pulled me to my feet. I don't need to be getting maudlin on your birthday. Her voice sounded so much like Papa's when he spoke of his young days. She held me at arm's length. I was surprised that I was just a little taller than she was and my aunt was not a short person. Maybe talking about it will make you feel better. Her voice had sounded so much like Papa's. My aunt smiled and it was all as if I was looking in the mirror. We look so much alike. People often think she's my mother. Her thick black hair that forms a slight peak in the front, a widow's peak as mama called it, except that Aunt Desma never married. We also had the same dark brown skin and the heart-shaped face with high cheekbones. Her wide smile, mine also like hers, shows off straight white teeth with a space, space between the two front ones. I admire the stand you're taking, she said. I couldn't put up with segregation when I returned from college, so I packed up and left Bermuda. It's so subtle on this island that tourists didn't know there was discrimination. You couldn't find a sign anywhere telling colored people where to go. We just seemed to know. I still can't figure out why it didn't bother me until I found out I couldn't take my class to the movies. It didn't affect you directly until that happened. You were protected, she explained. Segregation didn't sting me until my white roommate came to visit after graduation. I found out she could go to places that I couldn't. Like where? This was another puzzling part to segregation. We went to hear a band play at one of the hotels and found out she could get in, but not me. Her entire vacation was taken up finding a nice place where we could both go. The whole experience was embarrassing for I could go anywhere in her country and was segregated in my own. I closed my eyes and tried to imagine the Bermuda I was just finding out about. Aunt Desma gave a long sigh. Let's get to the garage before your mama comes to see what's holding us up. I was given strict orders to come and get you before your guests arrived. Her voice then went back to its normal rumbling tone. I've got a surprise for you. I almost forgot. Her laughter made my spirits dance to the joyful rhythm. She reached into the pocket of her smartly tailored suit, pulled out a small box, and pressed it in my hand. This is your special 16th birthday gift. Open it. Slowly, I pulled up the leather cover and then gasped. Nesting on white silk was a silver locket decorated with tiny, intricate flowers. See what's inside, she whispered. When I clicked it open, I was staring at the smiling faces of two persons, a man and a woman, their heads close together. Grandfather and Grandmother Johnson? I asked the question, knowing the answer, because a full picture of them was on the fireplace in the living room. Gee, thanks, Aunt Desma. I gave her a rib-breaking hug. When she spoke, her voice was a whisper. My father gave that locket to my mother on her 32nd birthday. A year later, he lost everything. When I turned 16, I was given the locket. Now I'm passing it down to you on your 16th birthday. It had been like a talisman, remind me not to lose courage. May it do the same for you. When she clasped the still open locket around my neck, I knew she was thinking about Grandfather Johnson and how he died. 
For a moment, we both looked in silence at the two people who had been severely damaged by unreasonable hatred. After I snapped my gift shut, a gentle tremor rumbled through my body as though my grandparents were giving me their blessings. At the same time, my Aunt Desma squeezed my shoulder and reminded me that I should be getting ready to greet my guests. She made me decide to wear the birthday outfit, which she felt was appropriate for such a special occasion, and even helped me fix my hair in a neat style, pulled back and off my face. After all of the fussing to get me ready, we did manage to leave the house without having Mama to come check on us, for it was long past the time for my few guests to arrive. When we walked down Loquat Lane together, I no longer felt upset that my Girl Cop block party had not turned out the way I'd hoped planned. And Desma was like a magic wand, a talisman, really. I pressed my hand against the locket around my neck and thought about how, in less than two weeks, everything had changed in how I saw the world and my place in it. Had it not been for the boycott, I would have gone on believing that I was the luckiest girl in Bermuda because I, was ha I had nothing to worry about. We reached the vacant lot and I noticed three long tables decorated with hibiscus flowers along the sides and on the top were several plates covered with white napkins. Mrs. Williams and Mrs. Jennings, who had Willard on our lap, were sitting and chatting on the bench under the little quad tree. The twins' mother seemed so at peace that I wondered where she had hidden Julie and Jolie, who would have been jumping around creating havoc. Mama and Mrs. Charter were standing at the tables, Mrs. Charter already munching on one of the sandwiches. The atmosphere was far too quiet for a block party, but I did not mind because I had my Aunt Desma. Where is everybody? I tried, asked, trying to keep the disappointment out of my voice. Even Eileen had not arrived, although she had been to the house earlier with the placard. I then remembered I was supposed to bring it to the party, but the way things looked, I would only need it when I went to the boycott later. Mrs. Charter shrugged her shoulders as she peeled back the napkin from one of the plates and reached for another sandwich. At the rate she was going, food would not be wasted even if no one else came. Why don't you go inside the garage to show your Aunt Desma your new mobilette, Mama said, looking at me smiling. That dress looks nice on you. I'm glad you wore it. It's a special dress. Thanks, Mama. In many ways, this was a special birthday. I held Aunt Desma's hand and stepped back stepped inside the garage. Thunderous voices practically pushed me back outside again. Surprise, surprise! Luckily, I fell against Mama and Mrs. Williams who had followed Aunt Desmond and me to enjoy what they knew would, I would soon experience. Both of my hands flew up to my face and I was laughing until my sides were pierced with needles. After spluttering and coughing a few times, I finally recovered and the first person I saw was Eileen because she was jumping up and down shouting louder than everyone else. Other first faces came into focus, and before long, I identified many members from my class, including George and, believe it or not, Charity Lamb, who was grinning as if her life depended on showing at least 100 teeth. For the next few minutes, I was surrounded by bodies, hugging me and wishing me a happy birthday. Hugh landed a wet kiss on my cheek and announced to my embarrassment, sweet 16 and get her first kiss from me. Get some... Get me some butter to smear on her nose, shouted Dedrick. Too late, I told him triumphantly. It's already been done. Everyone burst out laughing, laughing, and I reluctantly joined in, although I had the urge to push him and Hugh on the face of the moon that was going to be visible later. Mrs. Charter, not to be outdone, yelled the loudest, the insides of her mouth exhibiting a carpet of unswallowed sandwich. Give her another kiss, she said to Hugh. That's a good start. Next comes marriage, then comes Desma with the baby carriage. Enough of that, Papa's voice boomed from inside the garage, and with two steps, he was outside, standing next to Mrs. Charter. Let's eat. He glanced at her bulging cheeks. Reverend Matters will at least bless the food on the tables. Reverend Matters moved forward and waited for silence. Then he raised his eyes heavenward and reminded God of a long list of our sins that should be forgiven. Dedrick, who was standing next to me, whispered that he was going to take up a collection and use the money for those of us who dropped dead from starvation. I grabbed his wrist to restrain him just as a thunderous amen ended the minister's grace. The food was so plentiful and delicious that we all competed with Mrs. Charter about by going back and forth to the tables for mountains of helpings. Eileen and I found a spot near the garage to eat from our stacked plates. She told me that last night her phone had rung off the hook from classmates who decided to not only come to the block party, but to go to the boycott as well.
They told their parents about what I had said about my grandfather losing his mortgage and about Mr. Riddles and the property vote. Many of them also remembered incidents of segregation. I had to smile when she told how Charity Lamb's father told her that God helps those who help themselves, so she was allowed to come help me. God is just, and he wants his children to fight injustice, Charity said later. No one seemed to be concerned any more about the secrecy of the progressive group and what dangers could be awaiting them at the theater boycott. I looked around and was pleased to see that the class was well represented. Even Bella Smith had come along with her maids in a meeting. This surprised me until Eileen said that Mr. Smith had called to say that Bella would definitely attend. He was impressed with the way you handled the class and that you opened their eyes to what he had tried to fight against on the floor of the House of Assembly. The maids in waiting didn't call, but they're all here, Eileen said. We both had a good laugh when we looked over at them, huddled near the table with stuff plates and seemingly enjoying themselves. I'm glad they came, I said, and meant every word. George sat with Dedrick and Hugh, also near the table, and every now and then I caught him looking in my direction. I pretended not to notice and chatted away with Eileen. I only eat cassava pie on special occasions, Hugh announced in a loud voice as he helped himself to more food. He poked around his plate that was piled with three large slices of the pie. First, he stuck his fork in the top layer, cassava with chicken, the next cassava with pork, he sniffed and poked at the bottom level. Cassava without meat, all scrumptious. There was a round of laughter and for once he did not annoy me. Mama only baked cassava pie at Christmas and Easter, but this was indeed a special occasion. Everything had turned out special, and Desmond's arrival, my talisman locket, my classmates as guests along with many of the church members, neighbors from Loquat Lane and some faces I didn't recognize. Even Frank had joined the party, laughing and talking with Papa, his jaws stuffed with food. Most of these people are party crashers, Eileen whispered, looking around. They smell out a party and turn up. I could tell she did not approve, but they did, didn't cause any trouble, and this was a block party. Mama kept taking boxes of gifts back to the house to be opened later. Finally, after dancing to my favorite records, I insisted that the platter sing The Great Pretender over and over until Eileen sneaked up to the recorder and changed it to Billy Eckstein's Prisoner of Love and the dancing, dancing switch tempo. I danced many times with George, and then the Two clowns spoiled the fun by tapping him on the shoulder to change partners. Because they were my guests, I had to be polite. But when the Jennings twins tugged at me to play hopscotch with them, I practically leaped in the air with relief. Just before sunset, Mama announced that it was time to cut the cake and that we should be getting ready to go to the boycott. My guests immediately dropped their activities and crowded around the table, holding the largest birthday cake I'd ever seen. Mrs. Williams, who had baked it, must have used up a dozen cake pans. It was enormous. There was a chorus of praise from everyone. The center was white with a ring of delicate roses and red icing at the edge. Happy birthday, Desma, was written at the top of my girl caught equation. The letters looked exactly like Benny's calligraphy. Surrounding the letters were 17 white candles, one of them for good luck. Who decorated the equation on my cake, I asked, looking around at Benny, who was standing next to his current girlfriend, a short giggly girl who had her head on his shoulders. He winked at me. It's beautiful, I mouthed at him. Benny made us a template, Mama said, handing me a knife, and he supervised the decorating. There was hooting and whistling, and someone yelled, break down segregation, and that fella gets a decent job. Save that for the boycott, Papa told the person. We should be going soon, so let's sing happy birthday to Desmond now. A flock of sparrows swooped out of the loquat tree when the uproar, mostly off-key, cracked through with the familiar tune. Papa dragged out his church voice and competed with Reverend Matters, who held his notes longer than his prayers. When the noise ended, we slapped each other on the back, and someone had the nerve to yell, Encore! Encore! Not to be outdone, Eileen shouted, Segregation! You'll drop dead when Girl Cop comes with X, Y, Z! In no time, all my guests were chanting, ch chanting the catchy jingle. This is a great party, George said, taking my hand while he held a slice of my birthday cake in the other. I'm glad I came. I was tempted to wipe the mustache of icing from his upper lip, but did not yield, for I knew my action would attract attention, particularly from Mrs. Charter. When George saw me staring, he realized why and removed the icing in slow motion. 
My face went hot when he gave me one of his heartbreaking smiles. Soon, a caravan of three large trucks drove down Loquat Lane and parked one behind the other near the garage. Doors swung open simultaneously and a trio of men, Mr. Taylor, Mr. Richardson, and Mr. Thomas, all came out and stood beside their car doors. Then they saluted and in chorus said, happy birthday, Desma. We're at your service to drive you all to the theater boycott. Gee, thanks, Mr. Taylor, Mr. Richardson, and Mr. Thomas. Just in time, Papa told them. And then he added, while we're getting organized, why not help yourselves to some birthday cake? The sentence was still hanging from Papa's mouth when the men rushed up to the table and immediately Mama was filling up plates with not only cake, but sandwiches, cassava pie, and gingerbread. I was surprised at how much was left over after feeding my 5,000. Eileen, who had spent most of the time getting the young preacher Timothy's attention, suddenly came up to me. I won't be going in any of those trucks, she whispered, her lips pushed up in a scornful heap. Timothy has already told me that I could go along with him. How are you going? I had not given transportation a thought, but I quickly said, on my mobilette. I'd hoped all along we were going together. Great, she said, and I detected relief in her tone. I'll get your placard. Timothy and I will be responsible for it. You definitely can't manage it on your bike. Where is the placard anyway? It's on my desk where you and Benny left it. Eileen was too wrapped up with preacher Timothy to notice my disappointment. I had no desire to ride to the boycott in a truck with a sign, we tailor your trash or any of the other vehicles. I had a perfectly good mobilette to take me there and Eileen and I could have ridden the, to the boycott together. I knew that Papa would never allow me to ride alone. I was right. No way, he said with such emphasis when I told him how I was going. I could see the words underlined with two thick speech markers. The whole purpose of getting those trucks was that we all go together and be safe. No telling what is ahead at that boycott. You said yourself it was safe. You said the crowd was orderly and nobody looked interested in starting trouble. You said so yourself. I don't care what I said. You are not riding any mobilette to that boycott by yourself. I watched with dismay as one by one my guests packed themselves into the back of the trucks. George, I noticed, was standing a few yards from me, making no attempt to join the others. An arm appeared out of nowhere and wrapped around my shoulder. I knew right away that it was Aunt Desma. It's her birthday, Lionel. Her voice was soft, but it penetrated. She's a responsible 16-year-old, so give her your trust. I couldn't care if she's 60. She's not riding that bike alone. Anything can happen. Papa spoke in a bark, and I swore he had turned into a saucy dog, ready to sharpen his teeth on anyone who disagreed with, he, with him. I turned my head and saw George walk up to us. His voice was confident as he looked at Papa. Don't worry, Mr. Johnson, I'll go along with her. I can tow her on her mobilette. A groan fell from my lips. There was no way Papa was going to allow me to go with a boy and alone. Mrs. Charter had always said he was overprotective and for the first time, I agreed with her. See, Lionel, an answer to your fears. Fears. Aunt Desma said as she smiled, looking from George to Papa, this young man seems very responsible. Please, God, don't let Papa say something to hurt George's feelings. I would die on my birthday right here on this very spot. I held my breath as Papa turned to George, his eyes going over him from foot to head like a brush. Desma has a level head, so I don't see why I can't trust her, especially on her birthday. So far, she's made me proud, he said finally. Either God moved quickly with my prayer or Aunt Desma had a special power over Papa. I don't know which or maybe both. Despite those accolades, he lectured us both about the speed limit and going straight to the boycott. Finally, he finished and I wheeled my birthday gift out of the garage with great reverence. This bike is a beaut, Georgia. George's eyes sparkled as he stroked the fender and then the handles. I'm glad I didn't ride my bony shaker here. I caught the bus. We better be going, I said, as I pulled off my license that Mama had put into the gift card and tied it to the handle. I gave it a gentle pat before it disappeared into my skirt pocket. George held the handlebars as I made several attempts to climb onto the passenger seat. My skirt was too wide to fold comfortably under me without getting entangled into the spokes of the bike back wheel. Maybe you should put some pedal pushers on or something comfortable, George suggested, noticing my embarrassment. We were both impatient to get going, so this was a good idea. I knew a change had to be done quickly, for many of my guests had already left. 
The three trucks were the first to leave. Reverend Matters, his wife, Timothy, and Eileen followed in the Reverend's car. I had to smile the expression of disappointment on my friend's face when she ended up sitting in the back seat with Mrs. Matters and not with Timothy, who was beside the driver. I made a mental note to tease her about it later. You look great and more comfortable, George said, giving me an appraising look when I returned, changed into my favorite royal blue pedal pushers. My face burned again, so again as I jumped onto the back of the mobilette, this time with more agility. You can grip my waist. I won't bite. Promise, he said over his shoulders when I held on to the seat. The heat from my face could have burned a hole in his back. Before George started the motor, an air, an air splitting shriek made us both stop and look over our shoulders. Papa and Aunt Desma were talking to Mrs. Williams, who seemed agitated as she held on to Willard, who was wiggling in her arms. The twins were jumping up and down in front of Aunt Desma, tearing up the air with their loud wails. My aunt's main function seemed to be preventing their mother from finding a free hand to administer the tap of correction. The commotion had to be a prelude to their wanting to go to the boycott with the rest of us. I wondered how the matter was going to be resolved, since the boycott was not a place for those seven-year-old twins. I was thankful not to be involved in solving the problem. The screams escorted us right out of Loquat Lane and part of the way onto North Shore Road. Soon I was able to concentrate on the smooth way that George handled my mobilette and forgot about the screaming scene I had left behind. Ahead was the adventure of the Theater Girl Cup. <laughs>